This is Cashflow Ninja, episode 98, with Kevin Bob. Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Now, here is your host, MC Laubscher. Hello everyone, MC Lobster here and welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Ninja. I have a great show for you today and in today's show we're going to look at how to analyze a deal in the mobile home park industry. More than 6% of Americans, that's roughly about 20 million, live in mobile home parks. And with the real economy getting worse and worse for the average American, this is a niche and segment where visionary real estate entrepreneurs can provide value and serve a large and growing customer base. My guest today is Kevin Bubb. Kevin Bubb is a Florida-based real estate investor and serial entrepreneur with over $40 million of real estate transactions. His extensive investment experience spans the gamut of apartment buildings, single-family homes, office buildings, raw land, condos, and his favorite, and by far the most profitable, mobile home parks. With over 16 years of experience, Kevin now educates investors to locate, acquire, and create a higher-than-average return from this widely misunderstood niche of mobile home park investing. He shares his expertise through the Mobile Home Academy and also is the host of the Investing for Cashflow podcast, in addition to his real estate endeavors, Kevin is passionate about giving back and is the founder of several charitable organizations, including runningforbrews.com, a social running club with more than 10,000 active members, and hosts events such as the 72 Hours to Key West, an annual 280-mile bike ride benefiting impoverished families during the holidays. Please share your feedback and thoughts with me on today's interview. You can let me know your thoughts by tweeting me on Twitter at MC Lobsher or email me at info at cashflowninja.com. And please remember to join our mailing list by signing up at cashflowninja.com or texting cashflowninja, one word, all capitalized, to 44222. That's two fours and three twos. As some of my listeners may know, I live in Newtown, Pennsylvania, a town that's about 45 minutes away from Philadelphia, the birthplace of the United States, the home of the cheesesteak, the Rocky Steps, and also the hometown of the beloved founding father, Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin believed that investment and knowledge pays the best interest, and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. The Cashflow Ninja have aligned itself with partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner, Honored, provides supplements, nutrient-dense, and earth-grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GETONIT at CashflowNinjaHealth.com. A wealthy partner fundraise gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at CashflowNinjaWealth.com. And don't forget a wise partner, Audible. You can download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinjaBook.com. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas from Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to the Cashflow Ninja Podcast with your host, MC Lobsher. You must be prepared to ignite. Kevin, welcome to the show. Hey, MC. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Can you please share a little bit about your background and your journey as an entrepreneur and a real estate investor and how you got started? 
Sure, ab- absolutely. Uh, well, I um, I got started in real estate at a very young age. I was 19 when I, uh, I guess when I was introduced to the the business. Uh, I was still uh, in in college. I was actually uh, at a local community college. I was a pretty poor student, MC. So I didn't go away to school like a lot of my friends did, and figured I wouldn't waste my parents' money. And I just went to a local community college just to you know figure out what the heck I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And so I got lucky. I got introduced to real estate. I believe it was was in my my sophomore year. At community college, um, introduced by a girl who was dating her mother was dating a guy, a local guy, and he just happened to be a real estate investor. And uh, he introduced me to the business. Uh, he was a long-term investor. He had a lot of rental properties, uh, apartment buildings, things local. And uh, I think he just saw something kind of broken in me because I, I just I, I didn't really. I didn't have a direction. Seriously, I was a I was like a, a C and D student. I was a really bad student, and I just didn't really know didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I was tending bar while I was going to community college. I was having a lot of fun, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do uh, once I was uh, once I turned into a grown up. <laughs> and so he uh, took me underneath his wing and just um, he, he kind of showed me the ropes. I mean, I'm just I'm making a long story short. He he showed me the ropes. I followed him around like a little puppy dog for about a year. And um, and that's how I entered into the, uh, the the real estate industry. And so from the age of 20 all the way till now, I'm 37. That that's all I've done. I did finish community college, um, but I never really had any other real jobs other than and, and bartending is not a real job. So I guess I've never had a real job. Um, I, I strictly went into real estate investing full time and uh, have done it ever since. And so uh, since that point, I've I've owned hundreds of single-family properties, uh, hundreds of apartment doors, and uh, today our primary focus are mobile home parks. And so we own uh, hundreds of mobile home parks, or uh, hundreds of mobile home lots in uh, seven or eight different states uh, here in the eastern half of the U.S. So um, that's just really the condensed version of my background, and uh, as it pertains to real estate. Well, that's great. I mean, mentorship plays such a key role in in success and. And someone to uh, not you know show you the ropes, but guide you and and help you along the way. So it was fantastic that you found it at such an early age, where most of us are really lost. I mean, you know, there's not a lot of us uh, that come out of school and know I want to do X, Y, and Z, right? Mm-hmm. So it was great to kind of fall into uh, mentorship at that time. Yeah, I was really lucky. You know, I was just I was actually talking with my mother and father. Um, they were down here visiting me here in Florida a, a, a couple weeks ago, and we're having the conversation about that. I mean, I, I just I don't know where I would be in you know today if if it wasn't for David. That David was my mentor. He was the individual that got me into real estate. I really know, I'd have no idea where the path of life would have taken me if I wouldn't have had him come into my life at that point in time. And you know, a lot of people are out, they go out looking for mentors, and I I just I'm so grateful and I feel so blessed that he literally came into my life. I mean, I wasn't looking for him. I didn't know what I was looking for, but he obviously knew that uh, um, there was something in me. He saw something or, you know, maybe he just wanted to be a fixer up. He, he saw me as a fixer up or, you know, he wanted to do some work to me and he thought there might be some, um, some potential there. So, but I'm very grateful for him coming into my life. Now, now you've had some amazing success in the mobile home park industry. Can you mm-hmm. talk a little bit about the industry and, and what made you decide to uh, invest in a mo- mobile home parks? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Well, I um, like I had said, I, I've I've owned hundreds of single family homes. That's kind of how I got my start was buying, uh, buying, fixing, and renting. Uh, I was primarily a long term cash flow guy from the very beginning, so everything that we bought was always really meant for long term passive income. Now we have fixed and flipped homes. I, you know, I've done a lot, but you know, it was always a a buy and hold type strategy. And so I owned a lot of single family homes. Also had acquired uh, hundreds of apartment doors, and this is all leading up to 2008. And so basically, from 2002, I moved down to Florida from Pennsylvania, where I was raised. I moved down to Florida and really went on a buying spree. This is, I kind of had been in business for a few years, knew the ropes, and just went went wild and took advantage of all the great buying opportunities here in Florida. And then uh, 2008 happened. In 2008, um, basically, my business imploded, and I lost pretty much everything that I had worked for over those years. Um, most properties went back to the banks. Um, the properties that didn't go back to the banks, we sold at the bottom of the market just to basically help survive. You know, help us survive. You know, get a little bit of the capital out that we had in them. And um, so I needed to reinvent myself. And um, I did stick my head in the sand for a couple years um, after all that happened, just because I really didn't know what to do. I start, I did start a few other businesses, but I stuck my head in, in real, you know, in the sand as regards to real estate. Um, and then uh, 2010, I really went into a mode of. I need to rebuild myself and I need to re-educate myself and I need to determine what the next step in life is going to be. And I did know that I did know that 
multifamily was uh, was what I thought I wanted to go after. Um, I looked at my pre-existing portfolio of single family homes and apartment buildings. And I, I noticed that there were different patterns of each that I liked and disliked. And I, I could tell you that the, the pros of the apartment buildings definitely outweighed all the cons. And then, I, you know, it's just, it seemed like between the two, between single family and apartment buildings, apartment buildings, just, they seemed like they could get me to where I wanted to be a lot faster than with single family homes. And so I knew that I wanted to get into multifamily as I rebuilt myself. And while, while I was out Meeting everyone I could, having lunches, having dinners, talking to all the you know, other local investors, guys that were in the space, I came across a friend who introduced me to um, one of his uh, acquaintances that was in the mobile home park space. And I had lunch with him one day, and uh, he was very forthcoming and open about his experiences. Uh, he had been in the lending side of the business for like 20 years, and then had been an owner operator for the last or for the previous 10. And uh, he really piqued my interest with some things that he had mentioned of why he liked mobile home parks, why he thought they were a better asset class choice than apartment buildings. And um, th- th- that lunch literally was, again, that was like the pivotal point of, my, of, of this you know, uh, portion of my life where I was rebuilding myself. It was a pivotal point that really made me switch from multifamily to mobile home parks. And from that point on, that's all we focused on are mobile home parks. So that, that one lunch is how I got into mobile home parks. And, I mean, it's a fascinating industry. And, obviously, if you look at the economic trends, too, um, first of all, it houses a very, very large uh, portion of the population, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it's ever increasing. What are some of the other aspects uh, for listeners of mine that's interested um, in just researching a little bit further on mobile home parks? What are some of the aspects that makes this extremely attractive of this uh, this niche? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of attributes that make it attractive. I mean, one of the big ones is that you know there's a limited supply of mobile home parks in the U.S. They're, and they're not being built anymore. You know, a lot of local cities, governments, municipalities they don't they, they don't like them, so they don't approve new parks to be built. So typically, it's it, or every year there's a there's parks that get torn down. There might be a few that get built, but there's more that get torn down each and every year. And so it's the only class of real estate that has a diminishing supply. There's no other type. Of, I mean, you can you can look at shopping centers, you can look at apartment buildings, you know, um, office buildings, industrial spaces, anything like that. They're growing. They're not diminishing in supply. They're growing. Mobile home parks are the complete opposite. They're the only asset class that we're actually losing numbers each and every year because. The local cities and municipalities, they don't want them. They don't want them built. And so they don't get permitting to do that. So what that does for us is it creates a barrier to entry, knowing that if I buy the right mobile home park in the right market that has a high demand for affordable housing, I've got literally a moat around my property because no one else can ever come and build another one. So I don't have to worry about competition. So that's one of the things that are really attractive. And you know, another thing that's really attractive to us is uh, we know that Maybe you don't agree with me, MC, but I believe that we are doing no better as an economy as we were, you know, seven, eight years ago. I think that the recovery um, is not a recovery at all. I think it's false. I think we're in in worse uh, condition than what we were when we actually went through the recession in 2008, 2009. And so, you know, the middle class really is going away and we're becoming a much poorer nation. So with, you know, Top on, t- on top of that is that there's an ever-growing demand for affordable housing. The, the affordable housing demand is not being met. We're not building enough affordable housing to meet the uh, the demand for it. And so mobile home parks really fit in that niche just perfectly. You know, we allow people to live in a, a very clean, safe, and quiet community. Um, we allow those that probably would never have the opportunity to own a home. We offer great financing programs for them to become a homeowner and live the you know the the dream, you know, the American dream. And so. Things like that are what attract us to it. Um, and then one other thing I'll mention is that when you compare apples to apples, like a mobile home community versus an apartment, typically, if you're, if you're purchasing it right, um, the yields tend to be one, two, sometimes even three points um, premium versus an apartment building. So if I was buying an apartment at an eight cap, more than likely in the same market, I could probably pick up a mobile home park between a 10 and 11 cap. And so the, the returns are significantly greater than that of a apartment building. No, that's very interesting, and I do agree with you 100%. I don't think uh, 
there's ever been a real recovery. I think it was kind of tapered over. Um, I think for the average person in the street, they can see what's going on. Um, I've been fortunate enough to travel quite a bit across the United States over the last 10 years. And yeah, the average, I mean, j- just in, in most states, right, too, where there were a lot of manufacturing, of course, that they've been really hurt by the trade agreements. Mm-hmm. Um, and just in general, I mean, I, I just see it. If, if you ask most people, I think on one of my, even on one of my social media, Media platforms. I asked, you know, is there a recovery? What What are you seeing out here? Do, did you experience a recovery the last ten years? And most of the responses I, I got from um, people participating on on the social media is no, they haven't seen it. They don't see it with their neighbors, um, and uh, they they feel that they've gone a little bit backwards. So, it's, mm-hmm. and it's a conti- it's an accelerating trend I see as well, and that's why. There are some big players that you can talk to as well that's positioning themselves for this trend, right? Because there is going to be um, a big, big need for affordable housing mm-hmm. um, from folks that can't can't afford this. The other thing, too, um, on the finance side, uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Because that intrigued me, too, when you look at the current ownership of a lot of these parks. They, they they offer some interesting financing options to uh, mobile home park investors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's correct. You know, there's a a large portion of mobile home parks that were you know built between the the, the 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, that was kind of like the the golden years. I mean, you might find some parks that were built back in the 30s and 40s, but kind of the golden years were 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so there's a large population of of the existing park owners that are out there. And I don't know the exact number. Some people throw around you know 50% of all mobile home parks are owned by you know either the original developer, or maybe the second owner, someone that's aging and you know uh, up there and aging and aging out of that investment. And so so there's a large population that you know were maybe World War II veterans, or you know, they bought this property back, and when they're in, you know 40 years old, they're kind of like you know it's kind of their retirement plan. But now they're in their 70s, their 80s, and they're aging out of these investments, and it it represents a ripe opportunity um, from a buying standpoint for us to finagle, not finagle, but to to basically negotiate owner financing terms or buy the property on owner financing or you know seller financing terms. And it's it's beneficial for them because they've got a very low basis and uh you know they want to mitigate their capital gains exposures and they're also very used to that passive income each and every month. And so it's it, a lot of times we can structure very good win win scenarios when we're buying these mobile home parks. Uh, in fact, uh six of the mobile home parks we bought this year in 2016 were owner finance deals. And so um, it's very, very common that you can structure owner financing type arrangements on these acquisitions, which is very attractive for us because it's just, you're not jumping through the same hoops that you might go through the bank with. Um, and a lot of these parks we buy are kind of value added, meaning that the book books and record keeping by these current owners isn't the greatest a lot of times. And so a lot of times it might be challenging to even get bank financing on it. Um, you know, if that's the route you wanted to take. And so owner financing just makes it a lot easier to get into these investments. And, and on top of that, it's not recourse most of the time, So, um, which is very, very nice. So, yeah, it, it's definitely unique. I, I wouldn't say that it doesn't exist in other asset types, but it's it's very prominent in the mobile home park space. Yeah, and especially in this low interest rate environment, this is a great benefit for the owners because Absolutely. have they taken the full uh, cash from the loan? I mean, where do you put it and what mm-hmm. it, what is it earning? And then, as you mentioned, the tax liability at that stage, yep. the capital gains of hitting it all at the same time instead of just uh, paying it uh, o- uh, off over time. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that, that's typically how I bring it up. We never negotiate on the front end. Like we never go into a deal even. We never even bring up the mention of owner financing. We typically talk about it after we get the property under contract. And we always really move towards getting bank financing and know that we have a backup in case we can't um, convert it to an owner financing deal. But once you really get into a deep discussion with these owners, I mean, most of them, if they're if they are aging out, if that's kind of the um, uh, the, the the spot they're in in their investing career, then most of them they, they don't want to buy another real estate asset, so they're not looking to take that money to buy another active real estate asset. And so, really, a lot of them they don't really have a use to the money. They're they're going to sock it away in like a savings account. They're going to buy CDs with it or mutual funds. I mean, they're not really going to have a good use for it at this point in time. And so, it's a pretty easy sell when you can tell them that we'll give them five percent, you know, interest, uh, basically secured by an investment that they know better than anyone else, right? I mean, so. 
it's a well, I wouldn't say it's an easy sell, but it it's really a win win type arrangement when you really find out the needs of that that seller and you find out that they're not really they don't really have any other investment options for their money. And so um, more more times than not, we are able to convert them even if they haven't thought about selling it via owner finance. We've been able to convert them uh, into selling that in that manner. Now, when you uh, invest in this space too, there's obviously different park sizes, and mm-hmm. we've uh, there's some institutional guys entering this space as well to buy up some of these parks. What kind of number of lots is kind of the sweet spot uh, where you uh, have seen some most of your success? Yeah, you know, we 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 do own a few smaller parks that don't they're not really in our sweet spot that I'm about to tell you. Like we the, the smallest park we own is like 35 spaces and we do own another 41 space park, but really those those two were just kind of anomalies. I mean, they we you know, they just kind of came on our radar and they were good opportunities and we and they're in great markets when we bought them. But really what we're out there proactively looking for is uh 50 to 150 spaces. That's kind of the sweet spot. Um, 150 is kind of getting up there, you know, and in certain markets, 150 would be a park that a institutional investor would buy. But we have found that, you know, a lot of 150 space parks on like on that top or threshold, what we're looking for, they're still owned by the mom and pops. And so, you know, we've had the best luck in that range. That's kind of what we look for. And, you know, from a minimal side, 50 spaces in the right market, assuming that the lot rents are, you know, 250 or higher, it allows us to really be able to afford a quality on-site manager. You know, we can afford to pay someone full time to be there in the park. You know, if you have a, a park smaller than that or a park that has, you know, lower lot rents, you might not be able to afford to pay a full time manager or to have someone there on site. And so that's really why that's kind of that's what makes the determination of that 50 space size, allowing us to be able to afford good quality management there on site. You definitely want a manager and put that into your numbers. Um, what are some of the markets that you guys are looking at? Are there specific markets or? We have lots of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like hundreds. And so we're not, you know, mobile home parks can work really well, even in secondary and tertiary markets. And so um, we, we do have some parameters that we look for. Like we want to know that the the metro population of wherever the park is, we want to know that it's a minimum of 100,000, which is a very small metro. Uh, we want to know that the unemployment rate's below 6%. We want to know that the median home price is above 100,000. So we look at these different criteria, and then we really dig into, you know, is that market, does it have a shortage of affordable housing? You know, first we look at the vacant housing that's on the market. Then we look at like what the average rents are um, for two and three bedroom apartments and homes. And if we find that there's a big discrepancy um, from, you know, what's available in the low income space versus what the average median rents are for two and three bedroom apartments, then we know that this market definitely would support a, a mobile home park. It, it, you know, it, it, if, if most of them have parks in them, but they would support us coming in and buying a park as an investment. And so we're in a lot of markets. I, I don't know what the number is now. I mean, or we prospect in a, probably about 150 markets. And currently today, we're in nine different states. So we're spread out on the East Coast um, of the U.S. and um, we're ever so expanding. Like right now, we've got two other parks that are in contract uh, that are in two new states. And so I guess after those, if they close, they'll be, we'll be in 11 states at that point in time. There are a lot of mistakes that people make when they invest, and you've had some fantastic advice and even have an ebook available of uh, some of the most common mistakes that people make when they invest in mobile home parks. Are there some lessons that you can share uh, with my listeners on that? Yeah, there's a ton. Yeah, the book that you're referring to, it's called The 21 Biggest Mistakes Investors Make When Buying Their First Park. And one of my partners and I, we sat down and we just, we literally sat down one day. This was about a year and a half ago. And we hammered out every mistake that we heard people mention or that, that we might have gone through when we first uh, were getting into the business. And so we came up with 21. Um, no more, no less. There, maybe there are a few more, but uh, 21 is the number we came up with. And I'd say, let's see here. Let me, let me think because there's so many. Uh, and I, we don't have time to go through all 21. But, yeah. Um, I'd say one of the biggest challenges I see is that a lot of parks are more often than not parks are kind of what I would consider a value add type investment. And so they need something's been deferred, you know, either they have maybe some rental units that need renovations or the park itself, the infrastructure needs improvement, like the roads are in bad shape or the water and sewer lines, you know, when you're going into it there's going to be some kind of additional capital that has to be put in other than just the money needed for the down payment or the purchase of the park. And so a big mistake I see that new investors make, 
they try to buy a bigger property than what they can really afford. And so they kind of stretch their limits. Like maybe they can come up with enough money for the down payment and to get into the deal. But then let's say that 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 park needs one hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of capital improvements. Like it needs road repairs. It needs infrastructure repair. And so in their mind, they're like, you know what? I'm just going to get into this because it's the biggest property I can afford. And I know that five years from now, I'll have it all fixed up and, and life will be beautiful. And what happens is they plan on basically making those capital improvements out of the cash flow. And so they think that as they operate this thing, that any positive cash flow that's left over on a monthly basis, they're going to turn around and plop it into these capital improvements. And I can tell you that that is a never ending cycle that you never catch up with. And not only that is that you start building resentment for yourself. Your wife probably builds resentment for you because you've been spending all your time on this property that's not bringing any income in um, to your life. So you, you put a lot of money into the property as a down payment, but yet you're not reaping any of the rewards because you basically underfunded the property. Um, I've seen that be a, a, a big just brick wall that a lot of new investors have run into. And so just under, I guess the, the, the simplest way to put it is undercapitalizing going into a deal, um, not putting enough, not, not having enough capital to, to actually handle all the improvements all at once. So that's a big mistake that I see people make. Um, another mistake I see people make are buying mobile home parks that are treated as rental properties. And so the, the most attractive way to own a mobile home community is to where you just own the dirt. You're like you own the property and the tenants own their own individual homes and they rent the lot from you. So being a park owner, your only responsibility is the infrastructure itself. So you got to maintain the roads and the water and the sewer lines. But the homes themselves, if they have an AC break, they have a roof go bad or anything like that, it's up to them. So it's their requirement. There's a lot of parks out there that you'll run across that the owners basically have converted them into a basically a low-income apartment complex to where all the units are rental units. And I can tell you that it's a different type of demographic that you attract when you start renting trailers versus finding people that want to own their own trailer. It's just a completely different business model. And uh, typically that demographic doesn't treat the trailers too well. And you just, you find yourself in a, in a very low income type of rental um, rental situation. If you buy a park like that, where you're having massive turnover, you probably have some crime in your park. It's hard to keep out. And it's just not a, it's not a very attractive investment to be in. And on top of that, the banks don't like it. They don't like knowing that you own all the rental trailers because it's a it's an easily movable asset. You know, so if they're going to finance the park, they don't want to know that you can go in and yank out homes if you want and sell them off because that's part of their uh, of their collateral. And so there's just a lot of negatives that go along with owning a rental style park. Um, it's just it's not a scalable business model. It's really challenged to manage. And so um, I see a lot of investors make the mistake because they see that they'll see a, a park for sale and you you look at the financials on it and the gross income for a for a 30 space park that has all rental units in it. It's going to be probably double of what a 30 space park is that has just lot renters. Right. Because it right. might be a rental unit might rent for 700 bucks a month where a lot in that park might only be three hundred dollars a month. So the financials, they look really attractive and um and once you really dig into it and you find out if you really factor in the truth behind how much how, you know how the units are turning, um, how much repairs and maintenance your expenses are going to be on an ongoing basis, you'll find that there's not a lot of profit in the rental side of the business. And now you've just basically bought yourself a I, I call it you bought yourself an albatross. You literally have. And I've seen so many investors make that mistake buying into a rental type of park. Now we actually own rental units in our parks, and we own a few. We bought a few parks that way, but we, there was a, a back end game plan going into it. We never ever intended to run it that way, and we bought it right, and we had the right business plan in place to convert it. And so we've had success converting these types of parks to lot rental only communities. But I would never ever intend to go in and buy it based on its rental income, and then pay for that rental income and plan on running it that way for the the rest of my life. I, I it just it, the business model doesn't work. Yeah, and that was my next question was the turnaround strategy. So what uh, unit mix would be then desirable that investors can look at to say, I can take this over? And as you just mentioned, as part of my turnaround strategy strategy of turning this park around, I can uh, convert those through, you know, uh, lease to own or, you know, so, some some creative options or, or others that you might mention now. What unit mix uh, is a desirable uh, mix for you to look at when you when you evaluate deals? Yeah, I, you know, I guess it, what you have to determine is is what the demand in the market is for those that want to own their own home. And so I'll give you an example. 
you know, I'll give you two, actually two different examples, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. We, we recently bought a park. Um, I think it was a total of 52 spaces and it came with three park owned homes. Um, so it came with three rental units, which is a very small number. And, um, you know, we knew that we'd be able to sell them off. We didn't think they'd fly off the shelves, but we knew that we'd be, be able to sell them off. And so they, we have, we, I think it took us three months to sell all three of them, which is kind of long. Like if we had 30 homes in that park, that'd be a very long time to turn that park around and to sell off those units. Right. And so, you know, 30 months, if, if we're only selling one on average a month, that'd be a very long turnaround time. So for me, if that park had a lot more rental units in it, we might, it might not have been desirable to us because we know that we wouldn't have been a, be able to execute on our business plan um, quickly. It would have taken many years to do that. And so we might've turned away from that park um, if it had more rental units. And so on the other end of that spectrum, we recently also bought a park in Alabama that is a 68 space park. And it, um, right now it's got 45 occupied pads in that park and, um, and, and all 45 of those are rental units. <laughs> and so, uh, it's a unique situation. It's a, it's a newer park. It was built in 2002 and the gentleman that built it was a low end apartment. He was a affordable, uh, housing developer. So he, he built tax credit type apartment complexes. And for some reason he built this property. I don't know why I still don't know the real story behind it, but he basically built this property, went out and bought 68 brand new mobile homes back in 2002 and turned it into a low income. Basically it looked like an army bear. I mean, you go in there, it's like every unit was the same. They're like all gray. It was really scary. Like like a government compound. And, um, he turned it into a rental park and it went really bad for him. He lost a lot of money doing it. And so um, when we took it over, it only had 45 units left, um, but they're all 2002 models, which is kind of newer for a mobile home. And um, we knew that that market had a very, very high demand for those that wanted to buy their own mobile home and live in a park. Uh, we did a lot of research prior to, to actually even getting this park under contract. And so we felt very confident that for what we were going to be paying him for these homes, along with the property itself, that we would be able to turn around and sell them off for really cheap and basically ter- effectively turn this into a lot rental only park very quickly. And so th- this park here, um, we're probably looking at like an 18 month turnaround time to sell off all 45 of those homes, possibly even quicker. Um, we have a very, very high demand from these existing tenants that are in there that, that have cash. Tax season's coming up as well, which is very beneficial, especially when you're selling low end units like that. And so we feel very confident that we're going to be able to turn that thing around and turn it into a lot rental only park quite quickly. And, um, and we bought it at the right price. We got the right financing. We basically paid next to nothing for these homes. And these homes actually had a lot of value to them. So um, so that's a scenario that's kind of on the extreme end because uh, it is a big project. But it's definitely going to be one that, um, that uh, pays us very high dividends when it's all said and done. Very interesting. The other question that I had too is there seems to be obviously the trend – with RVs is growing stronger and stronger. Um, a lot of the baby boomers want to retire, and instead of being able to afford to purchase that, that condo uh, close by the ocean or by the beach or closer to, to the kids and the grandkids, they're now looking at RVs. Do some of these parks that you guys look at also have RV spaces? Are they just RV separate, or is that uh, something that you guys are not looking at? Yeah, you know, there's two different types of RV business. Um, one is the, uh, you know, like the overnight stays, more of like a transitional type RVer that comes and goes. Like they're driving from point A to point B and they're making stops along the way and they might stay for one night, might stay for three nights, but it's a very short stay. Yeah. Um, that's not really an attractive business model to us. Typically, those types of RV parks work much better. They're, they're kind of in seasonal areas, you know, uh, you know, summer vacation spots, things like that. And not that they don't, they don't make money because obviously they do. It's a, it's a viable business for somebody, but that model for us, it's got a lot of moving parts to it. And, um, it's just not one that we feel comfortable in at this point. Um, it's a lot more management intensive because you got so many residents coming and going, a lot more money changing hands. And so we do have some RV spots in our parks, but they're more of a longer stay. And so our typical RV or, are people that are working in the uh, surrounding areas. Maybe they're working at like a contract job for three months or four months or sometimes even longer than that to where they basically, it's a very, this is a very common work trend, um, especially for like general contractors or subcontractors that travel and do work is they basically tow behind their travel trailer with them and they'll go work a job for five, six months and they'll leave it there in the park. They'll fly home like maybe every other weekend, see their family and come back. But that's like their living quarters while they're doing this job. And so we do have spots like that in our parks. In fact, um, just this morning, we were installing four more uh, in that Alabama park I was telling you about. So we have some empty spots in that park and there's a high demand for um, for 
you know, longer stay type uh, RV spots. And so it's going to be a minimum month, uh, one month stay. Uh, they have to get their own water hooked up in their own name, their own electricity and all that. Um, but there is definitely a high demand for that. So we just put four spots in one of our parks a day. But it will be a one-month one month minimum. So this is going to be more of a longer type stay for somebody. And um, so there is definitely a, a big demand for that. Uh, but we do not look at the other type of business model like I told you in the beginning, like the, uh, the transitional RV. Or that doesn't really fit our model too well. Gotcha. Now, Kevin, one habit I've observed from wealthy and successful people is that they're always studying new subjects and learning new skill sets. What are you currently studying and what skill sets are you currently learning? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. New skill sets? I don't know. Public speaking, probably. I mean, that's one. Yeah, I've never been a big public speaker at all. And so I have been going to um, uh, Toastmasters and reading a lot of books on public speaking and uh, persuasion and things like that. So that's something that's always been, uh, you know, like the, the, literally the biggest fear, which is more, it's big, more feared than death, is public speaking. So it's always been one of those things that I've been meaning to, to um, you know, educate myself on and be more comfortable doing. I speak behind a microphone all the time, but um, getting out in front of a room of 100, 200 people, um, it just makes me nervous. And so that's something that I've been working towards o- over the last couple of months and uh, plan on doing some uh, public speaking engagements over the next couple of years. And so I just I'm really looking to get comfortable in that space. Fantastic. Now, a core message in our show is to leave our families, communities, and the world better than we found it by passing down a mindset, values, and principles to future generations, not just money. So if you Mm -hmm. cannot pass on any money to future generations and we're only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Hmm. That's that's a really good question. Um, So three of them. Um, Let's see. I'd say the first one would be Live a life of integrity. I mean, if, if you don't have integrity, you really don't have anything. I mean, your your word is everything. And so I'd say just try to live by a uh, life of integrity. And the second one would probably be, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big giver. I believe that um, I believe that we should live a life by serving others. And so I say that you, you should lead by giving and serving others. I think that's just, that's part of the reason why we we're put here on this earth is to help others. Uh, and then the third one would be, Make persistence a daily part of your of your of, of your work life of your routine. And uh, there's a there's a quote that I'd like to actually share with your listeners. It's one of my favorite favorite quotes, and it's by Calvin Coolidge, and it's uh, it's regarding persistence. And I think it's very fitting for this. So if you don't mind me sharing an MC, I'd love to share it with your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. So that's what I would say. Persistence would be my third one. Live a life of persistence. That's so true. Thank you for sharing that quote. And especially in today's age, right, where you see less and less of it. Um, I don't, and it's not, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's just in the United States. I mean, it's global. I see it everywhere, um, where there's a little bit l- less of it. So no, it's, thank you for sharing that. Now, how can my audience learn more about you and your company and your amazing podcast and just keep in form of all the projects that you're involved with? Yeah. So, um, the best way to probably reach me is just my website, which is kevinbupp.com. And, uh, my last name is spelled B U and then two P's like Paul. So kevinbupp.com. And then, uh, we, I have two podcasts I do on a weekly basis. One is uh, called the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. That's where I uh, interview other successful commer- commercial real estate investors and all the different uh, asset types. And then we also have a mobile home park investing specific podcast, which is called the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. Very simple and straightforward. So, And uh, we, we do have an educational platform as well where we teach others how to invest in mobile home parks. And so they can find, they can connect with me there and also find more about our show and listen to the previous episodes at mobilehomeparkacademy.com. So multiple different ways they can connect with me. Uh, but me personally, if they want to reach me, just kevinbupp.com. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your journey and your knowledge and providing so much value for my audience. Uh, it's a fantastic experience and I had a blast. Yeah, MC, absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me as a guest. And uh, yeah, you take care. Hi, this is MC Lobsher, the host of the Cashflow Ninja podcast. As you may know, I'm also the president and chief wealth strategist of Valhalla Wealth Financial. We help individuals, 
families, small businesses, entrepreneurs and professionals build their wealth outside of Wall Street and help investors maximize the use of every dollar in their personal economy and boost their investment gains. We do this by combining their capital and investments with the financial vehicle of the wealthy according to the infinite banking concept. If you are interested in learning more, you can email me at info at cashflowninja.com and I will send you a copy of Nelson Nash's book, Becoming Your Own Banker. Thank you for joining my guest, Kevin Bubb, and myself on the Cashflow Ninja podcast today. If you like what you hear and appreciate what we're trying to build here at the Cashflow Ninja, please subscribe, rate, and review our show on iTunes and share our show with family, friends, and your network. I really have been humbled by your support and feedback, and if there's any way that I could provide more value to you and serve you better, please reach out to me at info at cashflowninja.com. Don't forget to take advantage of the offers from our partners that aims to empower you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. Our healthy partner on it provides supplements, nutrient dense, and earth-grown foods and fitness equipment to help you achieve your next level of well-being and total human optimization. Our listeners can get a 10% discount with coupon code GETONIT at CashflowNinjaHealth.com. Our wealthy partner Fundrise gives everyone the opportunity to invest directly in high-quality real estate without the middleman. Fundrise makes the process of investing in the highest quality commercial real estate from around the country simple, efficient, and transparent. You can get started with as little as $1,000 and do not have to be an accredited investor to participate in some of their offerings. You can check them out at CashflowNinjaWealth.com. And don't forget our wise partner, Audible. You can download any audiobook for free when you try Audible for 30 days. You can download your free audiobook at CashflowNinjaBook.com. That's our show for today, everyone. Until next time, live a life of passion and purpose on your terms. You have been listening to the Cashflow Ninja with your host, MC Laubscher, the podcast empowering and inspiring people to discover how to generate their own income and manage, grow, and protect their own wealth in the new economy. Today's show notes and resources are available on our website, CashflowNinja.com. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals, and you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objective, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness. 